So it's a pleasure to uh, come out to Philly um, and be invited to speak to you. I just, is it Pennsylvania or Philadelphia for the hospital? CHOP, Philadelphia. I apologize preemptively. I just, I just saw that mistake on the title. Um, uh, so it's, it's fun to be here and to talk to a group like this. Um, Tony mentioned I have a really diverse background and training and a lot of different interests. I've been criticized for having too many interests, but uh, my greatest fear in life is becoming bored, and I, I'm so far very little risk of that. Um, so <clears throat> today, I'm got, uh, by way of financial disclosure, I'm the chief scientific officer functioning as a consultant for logical images, but I don't um, have any pharmaceutical relationships. Um, and I apologize. The... Uh, the font from Mac to PC got a little bit off, so my layout's a little bit off, but um, I work on a lot of different things, and as you can see from this slide, but specifically what I'm going to talk to you about today are a few projects related to medical informatics. Um, I recently got involved in microbiomics and all kinds of uh, crazy basic science questions, and that actually informs my work in informatics in the medical sphere, but I'm going to talk to you about um, computerized decision support mostly, and how that might influence your world, and, um, and what the future of that might be. Um, a few thank yous to the founders, Lowell Goldsmith and Art Papier of Logical Images, and to many, many other people who have helped in this work. Um, I did not create this from the outset, but I've been working on it for about eight years. So this is one of the problems, is all these people. So we have a lot of people to take care of. And we have some doctors um, <laughs> that are very enthusiastic. Um, but despite those enthusiastic doctors, we have to see these patients generally one by one. And there really aren't enough experts to see all these patients. This is especially true outside the United States. So we're focused on bringing the expertise of the medical world further and further down from the expert to the primary care doctors, to the nurses, to the patients. Um, and in different systems, those players in the medical sphere are more and more important. Um, so our work is designed to take all this medical expertise and package it into a system that can be accessed by people without that expertise. So does anyone recognize um, this? This is the old form of clinical decision support. It's called a book. <laughs> and so we used to teach medicine from these things, and people used to read these. Um, and so this is scabies and what scabies would look like for decision support 100 years ago. So more and more places don't use books anymore. Um, I know a lot of medical schools have just stopped altogether. But many clinicians really rely on this now. So this is clinical decision support today. Does anyone recognize this as Google Images, right? <laughs> so if you search scabies in Google Images, you get this. And so what is the filter for this information is the question. So you get all these nice images of skins. So that's good. And this is a scabies mite. And here's a cartoon. That's good. <clears throat> so you're searching for scabies. If you scroll down, you get more images. And then you get this. You say, what <laughs> is that? So that is a home remedy for scabies. That's an onion. So you didn't know that was true. And then you scroll down to page 7, you get to this. So that is not a scabies mite. So most people don't recognize that's not a scabies. Um, that's uh, a different type of mite altogether. So the information that you can get from Google is actually one of the most powerful things that's happened to medicine yet. Um, so every single medical student and every doctor searches Google now. If you have a question, search Google. I do it myself, right? It's the quickest, easiest thing to access on all platforms. So what happens if you search Google for anthrax? Does anyone know? Who are the old, the old people? <laughs> right. You get this, right? This is page one Google search for anthrax. So, you know, in, in our work, we've had quite a lot of meetings with the, um, the engineers and teams at Google. Um, they're very interested in what we do because they admit right out of the gate that they are horrible at medical search. So they, they know that the medical search is the number two bit of information after pornography that's searched on the web. That's true. So people search for porn, and then they search for health. <laughs> And sometimes they're together. <laughs> if you like looking at nasty skin pictures, it's kind of a weird overlap, but I'm going to leave that alone. Um, <clears throat> but you can see that searching a general database like Google is, is going to lead you to some bad sources of information. 
So there are three types of uh, users of clinical decision support. So power users, those are, they use the best resources available, they never cut corners. These will be the best physicians, they have the best information forming their decisions. Type B is good enough, so they search Google, and type C are the laggards. So there are still a lot of laggards out there who think that their brains are a good source of decision support for their brains. And that's just generally not true. Um, so we know that the more decision support that physicians use, the better their decisions are. There's many, many studies um, demonstrating this. Okay, so in my talk, there's going to be a lot of pictures of skin. Um, I know this is generally pediatricians. A lot of my slides are from adult um, diseases, but there, I'm going to show you a lot of clinical slides very, very quickly, not to teach you about those diseases, but I want you to think through what your brain is doing when you see these images. And so um, probably pediatricians in the room don't instantly recognize this, but every single dermatologist who sees this picture within the first one and a half seconds knew what that was. And how many people in here know what that is? Well, it, it is a penis, but besides that. Anybody recognize that, Haley? It's going to take a stab at it. So this is pearly penile papules. This is a normal variant. This is a normal penis. And these little bumps or papules are normal. So every man has these glands, these little growths on their penis. Some are more pronounced. But they really, really freak people out. And so this is a patient of mine who was misdiagnosed as having warts. So his family doctor misdiagnosed this as genital warts, tried to treat them over and over again. Six months later, he came to see me, and I told him in the first two seconds, you have pearly penile papules, that's normal. I brought in my iPad, and I showed him many pictures that looked just like it from our system, and he broke down in tears. And this was a 25-year-old, big, brutal guy. Why did he break down in tears? because the misdiagnosis by his primary care doctor led him to go home and tell his wife he had genital warts and she divorced him. So this misdiagnosis led to divorce and ruined his life. Admittedly, if you divorce your husband just for bumps, <laughs> maybe it was good in the end, but <clears throat> it is an example of something that I personally saw. I see this at least every month this misdiagnosis once a month. This is what condyloma looks like, or genital warts. Here's another example. These are two separate patients. This is one patient, this is another patient. Does anyone recognize this yet? You're probably seeing it in the emergency rooms and you don't know you're seeing it. This is a new disease or a new entity called cocaine levamisole toxicity. So levamisole is a contaminant in cocaine in the United States right now. And it causes this necrosis of the skin. It looks a lot like a rheumatologic disease, but it's caused by a contaminant in cocaine. The patients look very, very similar. Their ears all look like this. We have picture after picture after picture of this entity. But how does a physician recognize a new entity that's in their emergency room, a new disease? How does your brain get informed with new information that's easy pattern to recognize, but if you haven't been informed when you're seeing that very patient at the point of care, how can you access that new information? So that's the challenge of informaticists, librarians, is to bring all this knowledge right to that decision point in the 30 seconds you have as a physician to make those decisions. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you today about a few things. Disease variation, multiaxial thought, and then an overview of diagnostic error. And then I'm going to show you Visual DX. Um, the system that we built to help address some of these questions. And if there's time at the end, I'm going to show you um, another type of system we built for educational purposes. So what am I talking about <clears throat> is a paradigm shift in medical education. So shifting from fact-based memorization, thinking we can know everything from books, to a different type of teaching and learning where we teach core skills, we teach the language of the primary core skills, and we use uh, innovative technologies to teach students more quickly these very core skills and I can see that it is not projecting everything but there's things under this um, <coughs> and integrate into these in, into fundamental disease topics and then we give them tools so we teach them the core skills and then the very first block at UCLA is we teach information acquisition 
So we model information acquisition. How do students get information that's up to date, not to plug up to date, but is up to date, is relevant to that very patient? And that is the future of how we'll practice medicine, and that's how we have to teach students how to learn as well. So why do we want to do this? I'm going to talk about dermatology, but these are specific to all specialties, and this, these are about dermatology, but we'll come back to these ideas. So 40% of medical students go into primary care, and at UCLA they get seven hours of dermatology. A full quarter of all primary care visits include a skin or visual complaint. So we want to prepare all physicians with all expert knowledge because they're seeing all these things in the primary care sphere. So if you, and we know from many, many studies that internists and general practitioners are generally bad at recognizing things just by looking at it. So if you take all comers, it's about 50 to 60 percent of the time you're accurate just by looking at a, a skin finding. So that means if you go to your primary care and you walk in the door, there's a good 30, 40 percent chance they're wrong in their diagnosis. So that's what we're trying to address is how do you bring the expertise of the dermatologist or the specialist to the primary care office? So who hasn't been challenged by a visual clue? <clears throat> These are the background. It's an enormous problem, $40 billion in skin disease, um, lost productivity. Only 36% of skin problems end up at the dermatologist. And the most important thing is that skin clues are very, very often a clue to other much more important things. <clears throat> and those can be deadly. Um, so dermatologists pick up on these very subtle clues, and you can too. Um, how do you teach those subtleties to pick up on much more important things? This is also relevant that diagnostic error and delay is the number one cause for malpractice. So you hear about chopping off the wrong arm, wrong medication. Those are not the causes of malpractice and they're not the, co the cause of all the costs behind Mr. Uh, errors. Diagnostic error and delay is the number one cause. Okay, so now we're gonna go through a lot of uh, visual slides and instead of um, Focusing on the diagnosis itself, think of what your brain is doing when you see these things. So there's a few different thought processes I'll walk you through. So this is a patient, he came in, he said, I have an itchy arm. So this could be a 15 year old, I have an itchy arm. What is it? Eczema, right? Itchy skin, lichenified plaque, eczema, you give them hydrocortisone. He comes back, doc, your cream is weak. This is my leg now, three months later, what should I do? Really itchy, so you break out the triamcinolone. Comes back, doc, you're pathetic. Really itchy, this is my belly. You break out the clobetasol. But by now you should be thinking, hmm, eczema usually responds to those topical steroids, right? So <clears throat> when you're thinking about this patient, you have to start asking yourself, why is he not responding? What do these things mean? And why, what other bits of information should inform my decision? The next visit he comes in and he says, I got this bump on my head. You say, okay, it's a lipoma, it's a cyst, we'll take that out. And then in this visit you start listening to him and he has a French accent. So what did you do wrong? Where was the error? Which bits of information did you not bring from that patient into your decision making process, your diagnostic process? So if this guy with his color skin has a French accent, where was he born? Here. France, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Canada? No. So if he has a French accent, usually he was not born in the United States. Not guaranteed, but probably not. So this patient came from the country of Africa. Just kidding. Um, <clears throat> this patient came from a French colonized country in Africa. And he moved to the United States three years ago. So now when you go back and you think, hmm, he has itchy skin. If he were in his native country, this would be the number one diagnosis. You wouldn't even blink, you would know what he has. Does anyone know what he really has? This is his father. And he's blind. He has onchocerciasis. So in many countries in Africa, onchocerciasis and microfilaria are the number one cause of itching, the number one cause of eczematous skin like that. Very easy to treat and will prevent blindness. This is a bottle of onchocerca nodules. So this was the adult worms in his forehead in a nodule, that cyst that he had that you missed. 
So these are nodules that were cut out in Honduras. So how many people knew onchocerciasis was still a huge problem in Honduras? Not many, right? How can you remember which tropical parasites are in which country and which one causes itchy rashes and people come, they go? How can we know all that information and how can you apply it to your diagnostic process? Those are the types of things we're trying to address in our work with decision support. So we ask these questions. Why did this person, do they have HIV? Do they have not? Are they old? Are they young? Are they an infant, a teenager? From this place, are they from Botswana? Or are they from Philadelphia? Develop these symptoms, a rash, a cough, a fever. At this time, three years after they moved here, three weeks after they went on safari, etc. And we apply this information to our diagnostic process. But we begin the diagnostic process with pure pattern recognition. So when you saw the arm, you said, like kenified plaque eczema. That was your instant pattern recognition. And then when you apply this other information to it, you can refine that. And if you applied the right information, like his French accent, you would know he came from Africa and he had onchocerciasis, easy diagnosis. All right, now we're gonna go through some slides very, very quickly to demonstrate patterns. So this pattern we call sporotrichoid, and that's a hint to the diagnosis. It's sporotrichosis, but that's things running up the lymphatics, and each individual lesion is a nodule or papule. This is also an almost linear pattern, but these are ulcers. And this is leishmaniasis. This is multiple bites by a sand fly. And this is a very similar ulcer to that, but this is a solitary ulcer, and this is the groin, those of you that don't get out much. <laughs> this is a solitary ulcer in the groin. And so a solitary ulcer in the genitals is a differential diagnosis that is instant for dermatologists. Herpes, syphilis, chancroid, granuloma inguinale, LGV. You can list them all out, including leishmaniasis. This is LGV. So that's very quick patterns that mimic each other. This is a case I saw in Los Angeles. So we're gonna go through a few slides quickly. This is a papule in a guy who has a gown on. So if you're in a dermatologist's office, you have a gown, you're relatively sick. So a papule, what is the differential diagnosis of a papule? Spider bite, bug bite, MRSA, dot, dot, dot. He also has this pustule on his arm and he has this tape on his arm. So if you have tape on your arm at the dermatologist, you're quite sick. <laughs> it's almost like we have a stethoscope. Would be, something would be horribly wrong. <laughs> um, so this means we drew blood. So we checked some labs, so he might be sick. He's got this big nodule on his neck, and he has this. So if you have this on at the dermatologist, and you're in a public hospital in Los Angeles, what does that mean? Right, you have TB. So if you have this on and you're in Los Angeles and you have a bloody productive cough, you've got tuberculosis. So what do you want to know about this patient? This is his chest x-ray. Not good. You want to know who he is, where did he come from, what symptoms does he have, when did he develop them, all those things that we went over. So this patient is a South Korean professor. He worked for three months in Thailand then he worked for three months in Mexico, and then he came to Los Angeles with this bloody cough and these bumps. So what does he have? He still has TB, right? Anybody with a bloody cough in Los Angeles has TB. This is a CT scan. <clears throat> he still has TB. But the differential diagnosis for us in Los Angeles, for someone who's been through Mexico, includes what? Gold star, if anyone gets it. Coxie, good. So this is coxie every day of the week in Los Angeles. Mexico, west coast of California, everybody with these nodules and this cavitary chest is coxie. TB usually doesn't produce those pustules. So we biopsy him and of course it's coxie. So how would someone on the east coast remember coxie is like bread and butter on the west coast? It's very hard. These are bits of information that inform your decisions and how do you get that information into the diagnostic tree. I don't mean to just show you really hard cases. These are day-to-day -day cases that are misdiagnosed over and over and over again, and so are the common diseases. <clears throat> so we ask these questions. 
Okay, very quickly going through some slides and then um, I'll give you a background and we'll show you the real system. So this is a, what we call an eschar or necrotic skin, solitary lesion. This is a patient who was packing boxes in Ohio. If you're packing boxes, you actually have a spider bite. Very rare to see a spider bite despite the claims. So that's a spider bite. This is from upstate New York, closed down in emergency room. It is rickettsial pox. Very common cause of closing emergency room because they were thinking of anthrax. This is a patient with HIV, a fever in the hospital who has aspergillosis. I know you were thinking that. <laughs> this is a shepherd from Russia who has tularemia. Just keep saying it will come up eventually. <laughs> this is a postal worker from Gardena, California. So any postal worker has anthrax. <laughs> that, that was a joke. This is not a postal worker, but that is anthrax. Um, so same differential. This person went on safari in Botswana. This is true. And 5% of people who come back with a fever have this. And that's African tick bite fever. You get that, Haley? I saw the cheers. You got it? Good. <laughs> And this person has intractable diarrhea and HIV. It's cutaneous amoebiasis. And this guy can't speak English, and he's from Iraq. And maybe if he could speak English, it wouldn't help you because he has cutaneous leishmaniasis, my favorite disease. So anytime you say leishmaniasis from here on in, gold star. <laughs> it's always in the differential. So that's the differential of one type of lesion, many different factors influencing it. I'm just showing you the top of the, the thinking. And now, these are all examples of cutaneous leishmaniasis. This is the textbook case, so the picture you see in a textbook looks like this. If you miss this presentation of leishmaniasis from someone from Central America, you are fired. But <coughs> you can miss these other ones because they look funny. These are all cutaneous leishmaniasis. This looks like psoriasis, easy to miss. This is white skin. It's someone who traveled to these countries. Looks like tinea corporis can be wet, look like a basal cell. This last 15 years, Leishmania recidivans can be really horrible. And this is a patient from Brazil who has these on his feet, this is his face, and this is his arm. This is all the same disease. So most of you have never seen cases of Leishmaniasis in your office, and how could you recognize all these wild variants of just one disease that you may have never seen? How could you teach that to a medical student and more importantly, if you're practicing, how could you inform your diagnostic process to make the right choice? We know from cognitive science that if you don't get the right answer into your differential diagnosis in the first five minutes of care, you have a very, very poor chance of getting the right diagnosis. If the right answer is in your list, you have a much greater chance of choosing the right test to do next. So that's well proven in cognitive science for many things outside of medicine is having the right choice lets you choose the right test. So our goal is not to give people the right answer, it's to give them the right choice. So we give people a list of things to think about based on symptoms and presentations. So here's a classic exam. So if you're medical students, you take this exam. So here's a few cases. Just go through what you're thinking through these cases. Papules on the wrist of a child, pustules on the wrist of a child, nodules in the axilla, diaper distribution rash, nodules on the penis, crusted plaques on the feet, and this is the primary lesion. All of these were caused by this mite. Those were all scabies. That is a really wide range of how one disease presents, and all of those are classic presentations to dermatologists but I can tell you so many hundreds of cases of misdiagnosis of diaper derm, STDs. These are so common, these misdiagnoses, and they ruin lives. They really do. This guy gets divorced. This kid goes home and spreads it to everyone in the family. People lose time at work. These are common diseases, but the misdiagnosis problem is huge, and the ripple effects are huge. So how do you make these diagnoses more easy? So just a little bit of background of diagnostic error and decision support. This is what we talk about in the media. This is the big problem that's hard to study and hard to conquer. So we know that misdiagnosis leads to these things, bad treatments, long stays, 
patients are upset, they think you're a loser, and sometimes they die. And there's a growing concern about how doctors think and how we can inform our diagnostic process. I'm not going to bore you with the cognitive science behind these things, but it's really exciting and to study how people make decisions. So I'm just going to briefly talk about these two types of thinking called System 1 and System 2. This is instant recognition. So when I see pearly penile papules, it, it takes me about half a second to know what they are. <clears throat> when you see pearly penile papules, you don't recognize that. So you go into your brain, your education, you get out tools, and you apply rational thought of system two thinking to influence system one. So this is perceptual learning, and this is adaptive learning, and we hope that by repeated perceptual um, enhancements, you can adapt and get better and better and better so that you can use this much more frequently. So to practice medicine, you need to be up here almost all the time. Like when you drive a car, you don't have to think, this is a stick shift, this is a steering wheel, this is the blinker, every time. You get in because you know how to drive a car, you start texting, you can keep driving. <laughs> <laughs> but that's because you had to do this when you were a teenager. So once it becomes routine, then you can do it automatically. So when you can recognize something instantly, it lets you feedback on both of these systems and ultimately make a better diagnosis. So clinical decision support, this is our mantra. You use the best clinical knowledge and recommendations to inform your decisions at the point of care with patient-specific information. There are very different types of decision support. So there's um, medication like Hippocrates, there's testing, management decision, but I'm going to talk about diagnostic decision support. And there's pseudo-decision support that many of you know about. So these are um, disease-oriented knowledge resources like up-to-date medication resources, things that are information that it's very, very handy to have at your fingertips. And so that is support for your decisions, but it's not patient-specific. So this is like just having easy-to-access information. But we ask ourselves, what about other industries? Do they use decision support? So does your pilot use Google to get from Philly to LA? No. Does he memorize the route? Mm -mm. So the airline industry to overcome crashes has really, really high standards for their tools that they demand that their pilots use. So they use Boeing's technology, they use the fanciest navigation tools and they're required to use them. And they can't be drunk or high, um, so they test them. Doctors have very low standards for what we use. We try to use things, but in general, people are just allowed to do what they want, and occasionally they're drunk. <laughs> um, so we're shifting from this, the old paradigm, to memorizing things, unaided decisions. You carry around papers and books in your pockets. So now we memorize core skills only, so we memorize the language of uh, primary care. And we make assisted decisions. I bet every single medical student has either a smartphone or a tablet with them almost all the time. And we model information acquisition. And this part is really important. This is getting more and more and more important. We share the responsibility of the decision with other providers, nurses, and the patients. So this one, we hide our doubts. And that's old school doctoring. Now, if my doctor didn't have a computer and look up the drug dosage on Hippocrates, I would not trust them. Like, I want my doctor to look things up on the computer. They had better double check it. And we have a lot of systems to help them do that, so that's what we're working on. So this is what we're working on, is how do you apply these in medical informatics? So, oops, sorry. <clears throat> Multi-axial thought. Um, and multi-axial searching for patient-specific decision support. And I'm going to spend one minute on a project that um, I put in here for this group in specific, which is the Human Disease Phenome Project. So this would be a scientific approach to how we study disease variation. So physicians are in this middle blue circle. The patient is before and after treatment, and so we can characterize the range of disease presentation of the patient. And scientists have all these fancy new tools outside of them, so genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and how these factors influence these factors that contribute to this person in the middle, which is the phenotype or the manifestation of the human plus their disease. So physicians have to get better and better at describing this so scientists can study this. 
And these slides are a few um, slides I put together for this type of discussion. So these are axes of variation and disease. This is one disease, this is acne. So this is, we call this acne and we call this acne. So there's a few different things that are changing through each of these slides, skin color, severity, inflammation. These are all different types of fungal infections of the skin. So some of them look like regular tinea corporis, but you can see the wide variety of inflammation. These are all manifestations of leishmaniasis I showed you before. Some very destructive in a kid. This is a solitary lesion. Every one of these has the same diagnostic name, a seborrheic keratosis. These are very subtle. These look like melanoma, same diagnosis. This is psoriasis demonstrating the influence of skin color. So if you're white or you're blue, like me, you're so white, you're blue, it's very easy to see erythema or psoriasis on white skin. But as you get down here, it's very challenging to see redness in black or brown skin. So how does that influence our diagnostic process? This is a solitary lesion of leishmaniasis, so individual lesions can look different, and treatment can affect people differently. So these are leishmaniasis over courses of treatment and how different people respond differently to the treatment. And this I threw in at the end for this group. Does anyone recognize this disease? Good, so Haley's saying these are angiofibromas and this is tuberous sclerosis. So you can recognize these very early on in children, and you can recognize what happens later. And how does that change in the phenome affect your diagnosis at what point in time? There are a lot of dermatology atlases or visual atlases, collections of information. To date, all of these suffer from the same problem, um, which is the, the filtering system to get into them is very, very low. So anyone can put anything in these atlases. So, and some of them are influenced by pharmaceutical companies. Um, some of them are poorly organized. Some of them are okay, but they generally are very bad decision support. So I'm gonna tell you about Visual DX, which is the system that we work on, um, and how we teach the core skills, the diagnostic process, and then we give the tools like Visual DX to students. <coughs> um, just a few slides of background about, um, about Visual DX. So this is by far the world's best medical image collection. It has the entire collections of many entire universities and all the private collections of many famous dermatologists, radiologists, ophthalmologists from all over the world. The reason that they contribute these is because they trusted the editors and they keep the copyright of all their images. So we just have permission to use their images. And typically we scanned all their old Kodachromes for free and that's why um, they gave those slides to us. Um, now it's a very successful um, enterprise, um, but importantly, it's edited by experts. So it's created and edited by experts. We use standardized terminology, which is important to interface with things like the medical record and scientists, like RX Storm, SNOMED concepts. And we have references into PubMed for every bit of data that's in it. Um, the background of how it, widespread use it is, it's in over 1,300 hospitals already, six entire states. I think we're over 40 medical schools. Um, it was voted the favorite app by the Harvard Med students year after year. It integrates directly into the EMR, EHR. You can search directly from the up-to-date search bar and integrates into telemedicine consults that I'm gonna tell you about if I have time. So <clears throat> I'm gonna stop here and I don't know what time it is. Quarter to, okay. So I'm gonna demonstrate the actual system. Um, this is the home page for Visual DX, and I logged in as me through my proxy server, so it thinks I'm UCLA. So the system knows where you are, so that can help because you can have important um, formulary information or geographic information that's influencing the system. And you can put specific links. For example, this is telling me there's a measles outbreak in California, and this is about that cocaine vasculitis outbreak that's in some of the major cities. So these links are specific to me because I'm using my UCLA proxy. But if you log in through CHOP, it would be different. And generally, there's two portals of entry. So we learned very early on that physicians, like everyone else, like to search like Google. So Google won the search information war very early on. So people like to search from this type of bar and how many letters do you have to type before you want your information? Four. 
So everyone wants instant results with four letters, and the computer should know what you're thinking and give you the best results, right? So we know doctors and students already want to search here, and two-thirds of people use the system by searching here, and one-third use this. Using the differential builder is the much more powerful way to use the system, but most people start on this side, and I'm going to demonstrate to you what they do. So the patient comes in, they have an idea, so they have their hunch of what they think the patient has, and they want to look it up. So I think my patient has a drug eruption to Captopril. Oop. I had to log in. Maybe I'll log in as CHOP and see what happens. <clears throat> All right, so now you can see I logged in as CHOP, and because CHOP's on a pilot, um, it's just giving the logical images logo here and not California specific links here. Um, but the system's the same behind that. So my patient's on Captopril. So I start typing and it knows there's only one important thing that starts with CAPT. So here's a drug symbol for Captopril. I'm going to click on that and it's going to instantly take me to all the drug eruptions known to be caused by Captopril. So not just drug rash, that's it, that's all you get from the PDR. These are all the published reactions to Captopril and all the citations, so if you want to know the seven citations for Captopril causing psoriasis, you can instantly click through to them. More importantly, psoriasis is very easy, but um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of things that you might not be familiar with, um, <clears throat> like pemphigus foliaceus, and what does pemphigus foliaceus look like? It looks like all these different pictures like that. So you can instantly get in there and compare this to your patient. So that's, that's how you might use it from, the, from this home page. You can start here too. You can type in, my patient has cellulitis. So I type cell, and you can see all these different things that are cell, but I want the diagnosis cellulitis. So I'm going to click that. And it takes me instantly to what would be like a handbook link text for a classical um, textbook so you can read about the synopsis what to look for the diagnostic pearls and then one of the most important things is the differential so this is the differential for cellulitis so you can instantly click through and say well what's a fixed drug eruption this is what a fixed drug eruption looks like and more important is that instead of the one classic picture we have the variation of disease so these are all the different types of fixed drug eruption in different skin types, different body locations. So you can really <coughs> compare things that are your patient. Okay, so that's, that's the basics of the system, but it was originally meant to be used by primary care doctors using this, the differential builder. So in this for format, if you're in the uh, choose a clinical scenario, you can see over here, these are all pediatric scenarios. So there's, I don't know if you can read it from back there, but this is neonates with rashes or lesions, children, specialized content <coughs> focusing on child abuse. And these are adults. And then these are specific <coughs> clinical scenarios, so fever and a rash, travel, um, specific areas of the body, hair, etc. And then these are specific um, modules for specialized content like um, infectious disease uh, with radiology, oral mucosa, ophthalmology, etc. And there are some public health modules down here for education um, that are useful, like child abuse recognition, et cetera. So I'm going to go through a couple examples to show you how the system works kind of behind the curtain. So let's choose fever and a rash. So this is an adult with a fever and a rash. And we broke down things into easy, visual, recognizable icons. That, so you don't have to know the language per se. You just have to be able to recognize it. So let's choose vesicles and pustules which could be either pustules, vesicles, et cetera, or you can choose this master icon. And now it will generate the visual differential diagnosis for you of vesicles or pustules in a patient with a fever. So before I go past this page, burn this image of anthrax into your mind. So this is a grouped vesicles with a swollen eye. That's a very rare presentation of anthrax. I showed you the classic, which is an escar. So then you can refine your differential by the body location or a pattern like widespread, photo distributed. Let's choose widespread and click OK. Now you can see that anthrax is no longer in the top because that's a localized disease, but it's showing you the differential. 
it will prompt you every time you enter things, the key findings will change and it will prompt you with key questions you might want to ask. You can enter those. Or you can type extra findings in here, like patient has a history of HIV, and I want to know the things that are more common in patients with HIV. So these five diagnoses are more common in HIV with widespread vesicles and pustules in a patient with a fever. So you can go in and compare <clears throat> all the pictures of herpes simplex disseminated and say, is that really my patient? So that's the very simplest way to use it. I'm going to show you the same thing again, but instead of vesicles, I'm going to choose eschar. Now when you look across these images, it's showing you eschars because that's what your patient has. And although anthrax is on the top again, it's showing you that eye three days later with the eschar. So it's going to help you avoid missing atypical variants of the common diseases. If you look in the image stack, you can see that now that eye with the vesicles has been stacked lower and the eschars are all on the top. <clears throat> um, I know there's a radiologist in the room, so I wanted to show an example of how the system would work with multiple different types of symptoms. So this is a module that includes, um, maybe, ACK. Let's see. Well, I'll show you I for now and come back to that. Um, so this is this is ophthalmology. So instead of skin lesions, now it's broken down by eye findings. So I'm horrible at ophthalmology. So I can choose cornea and then any different types of corneal defects or the master icon and it will show you all the different corneal defects. The key findings will change. The most important thing with ophthalmology are itching, pain, and is it one eye or two? So if you choose unilateral, click OK and itching, click OK, it will start showing you different sets of diagnoses. Um, so each of the modules works independently like this, and they work together as well. So here's adult pulmonary infections. So here, things are broken down by patterns of chest x-ray findings. So if you choose a solitary pulmonary nodule, this will give you the differential of infections for that nodule. And if your patient also has the pustules, like our patient had, you can choose that, and then it will start mixing skin and radio radiology. And you can see this is our patient from South Korea with coxie. Here's his pustules. Here's his chest x-ray. Here's his lab. Here's his CT. So <clears throat> depending on what you're searching by, if you're not sure if it's the cough that's more important or the papules or pustules, you can search by any different angle. Um, and then I'm going to show a couple of specific examples for pediatrics. Let's take a neonate with a rash, and let's choose vesicles again like we did with our adult. So now this is the differential for neonates with vesicles or pustules. It could be all over. Let's go to the key findings. As dermatologists, we know one of the most important things is when did those vesicles appear? So were they present at birth, first few days, first month? If we choose present at birth or fever, the differential will change dramatically because vesicles present at birth is one list of things and it's a subset of the other. So now there are only 19 diagnoses that would present as vesicles in a neonate, etc. So there are many, many hundreds and hundreds of findings to diagnosis relationships in here um, and thousands and thousands of images. One important thing you can do is, let's say you started with a disease like sarcoidosis. <clears throat> so if you're in sarcoidosis, it will take you to adult rash. So you can see here the different types of adult rash. If you change to dark skin, then it will instantly start showing you all the pictures in dark skin instead of light skin. Or if you change to ophthalmology, it will show you sarcoidosis in the eye. If you change to fever and rash, hair and scalp, it will bring you to specific things about your patient in that module despite the diagnosis is the same. So it, it scans across different types of content all at the same time. Um, and I think um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to a couple studies we did, and then people can ask me questions, and we can tinker around with it at the end if you want. Um, so I'm going to go quickly back to this just to show you a couple things that we've done research-wise. <clears throat> so very early on, we wanted to ask the question, well, does it work? 
despite the fact that no one has ever tested whether textbooks help doctors, we wanted to know if our system does help doctors. So we compared a stack of textbooks to five minutes of training in Visual DX, and we gave different types of physicians challenging cases with visual manifestations. And so we compared emergency doctors, internal medicine, family med, and we gave them either books, so these are the gray bars, or five minutes of training in Visual DX. And you can see that their differential diagnosis included the right diagnosis more than twice as often. So 120% improvement if they use the Visual DX system to generate a differential rather than the books. We all know how we search in books. The Derm Atlas is the number one dog-eared book in practices. So we have a hunch, we go to the Atlas, we look it up, we're wrong, we don't know what to do next, and then we're frustrated and we make a bad decision. So using a system that lets you search by morphology, by symptom, and generate a differential was successful to generate a better differential. So we were happy that it demonstrated that in all types of doctors, including dermatologists. <clears throat> and then a study we just published a few months ago was about this problem. This is not a great interest to pediatricians. And although pediatricians were part of this uh, study, pediatricians were highly, highly accurate with this diagnosis. But this is a big problem in adult medicine. Does anyone recognize this disease? Here's another example of it. So cellulitis, or soft tissue infections, is an enormous problem for admissions and readmissions in the United States. There were about 240,000 admissions in 2005. We did a study, we compared 150 continuous admissions of cellulitis in Rochester, New York, and Los Angeles, and 28% of the admissions were in error. So one-third of everybody admitted for cellulitis did not have cellulitis based on the expert opinion of the dermatologists and the infectious disease services together. Why is that happening? So what is this disease? Two red legs, painful with bulla. You can see why someone would be worried about an infection, but cellulitis does not occur on two legs simultaneously. Bilateral cellulitis is itself an oxymoron, does not happen. So, <clears throat> but that wasn't the majority. 28% of these cellulitis cases were not cellulitis. So, <clears throat> most commonly it was stasis dermatitis. So this is stasis dermatitis, so is this. And a full third of the misdiagnosis were stasis dermatitis, which is just red painful legs caused by swelling. And these patients get admitted to the hospital, they get IV antibiotics, they stay for three to five days, and they get better, and they go home. But it cost the system $11,000 per admission. They got unnecessary IV antibiotics, they got C. diff, and some of them died. So <clears throat> Visual DX was compared to the admitting team. So entering symptoms into Visual DX contained the right diagnosis four times as often as the admitting team. And so that demonstrated to us that this system, in the hands of someone who only speaks the language of red, pain, fever, will give doctors a better differential to think about and thus enhance their ability to make the right test, make the right choice, four times as often as the doctors brain themselves. Um, I'm, I'll, I think I'm basically out of time. I'm just going to show you a few slides to wrap up. Um, Visual DX works from the EMR, and it works on all mobile platforms, the iPad, the iPhone, the Droid. Um, so this is an example of how one might use it in Epic or in any EMR. It uses info button standards. So you can either use an info button like this or right-click on problems in the, in the EMR, and this button will directly take you to a Visual DX page that will show you that specific drug if you chose that drug. And then it, you can choose those citations directly from within the EMR. So we know that physicians in the future will spend all their time in the EMR, and they want their resources directly from the EMR. <clears throat> and then you can search by drug, and it will show you how likely it is to be one drug or another. It will ask you what's the timing of one drug to the other. But this can all happen directly from an info button in the EMR. The other thing is you can search directly from up-to-date, I, I mentioned, so you can search for psoriasis directly from the up-to-date search. It will take you to psoriasis in Visual DX. Or you can search for pustules and rash, and it will take you to the differential for pustules or vesicles in an adult or a child. You can switch on the fly.
Um, and <clears throat> I've been using it a lot in telemedicine. This is important for educating primary care out at the point of care. So this is an example of telemedicine where you have these targetoid lesions on the hand, vesicles. This is, it took me half a second to know what this is, but I commonly get this referral. So I send back a consult that took me three minutes to write the entire consult. This patient has urethema multiforme. You can read about this at this link. This link, I'm not going to show you, but this takes them directly to urethema multiforme, and I populate it with images that look exactly like their patient. So they are highly confident in my decision. <laughs> More important than that, they have that in front of the patient, and the patient looks right at it and says, Doc, that's exactly what I have, like the pearly penile papules. And the confidence in the primary care goes up, and the dermatologist. So I never had to do anything except this took me actually 12 seconds to make this link and paste it in here. The whole note took three minutes. The second most important thing I do is I say, the differential of itchy blisters on the hands can be reviewed here. This link took me 20 seconds to build. Maybe it'll actually open. If I click that, it will open the page for the differential for hands, itchy, and blisters, hopefully. And so if I'm not there when the patient comes back and they miss some important thing like the French accent, this is the differential. They can go through it themselves and think through, oh, actually, my patient has this. It's dyshydrotic dermatitis. Duh. So I give them a resource to use when the consult is over. <clears throat> and and I will wrap up. <clears throat> this is another example, but I'm not going to go through. This is a 55-year-old man with blisters on the hands, another example, but this is in an alcoholic. Again, it took me one second, literally, to know what this was just by looking. Haley's mouthing, porphyria cutanea tarda. She knows this. I can say this is PCT. This is a really complex thing for me to convey to primary care. This link conveys exactly what I need them to know, and this is the differential I want them to know. <clears throat> And I'm going to stop there. Um, we're spending a lot of time now to teach people the language, the primary care language of what is a pustule, what is uh, linear patterns. That's the most important thing to have someone be able to enter this system. We often critique that says, well, primary care doesn't know what a pustule is. They don't know what a vesicle is. They don't know what a uh, ground glass infiltrate is. And so we know it's important to get that very primary language to those doctors. And so we're working a lot on that entry point. We do have systems in place to use that. <clears throat> I'll just um, show you the link to it so you can use it. Um, it's also for free. It's always for free. It's here. It's called learnderm.org. So that's free anytime, any place. And if anyone's interested in the educational tools that we're building that involve either LearnDerm and it says learn there, but we also are interested in teaching pathology, radiology, all the primary lesions. Um, I'm happy to talk about it after. So um, I'm going to stop there. So thank you.